Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday evening Bible study for Wednesday, November uh, 15th, 2023. We are in the book of Colossians, the third chapter. Let's start in verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as he, as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Paul is dealing with practical matters here. He's dealt with them that they should uh, put Christ first. He's dealt with them that the Spirit should lead them. He's uh, talked about the right way to live, that uh, we are in Christ, and that he's our head, and that um, you know he's dealt with principles, and now he's uh, continuing to deal with how we should live. He's not making a moral code for Christians. He's giving guiding principles, and he's, he's doing this because he has already realized, and it took uh, Christians actually uh, nearly a millennia to catch what Paul was trying to tell us here, that Christianity is based on principles and concepts, not precepts, not prescriptions. Judaism, most other world religions, were based on precepts. Here's the things God told you to do. And, you know, it was black and white. You either were worshiping an idol or you weren't. You were lying or you weren't. You'd murdered somebody or you weren't. You'd raped somebody or you hadn't. Um, kind of thing. Uh, you, it was black and white. Y'all, sh You shall not do these things. You shall do these things. Uh, you know, you're going to assemble on the new moon and have a feast and etc. Offer a sacrifice and have a feast. You know, and there was do's and don'ts. And if you did the do's and you didn't do the don'ts, then you were right. And it's a moral code. And sometimes the moral code can be very complex. And the moral code can split hairs between this, that, and the other and, you know, make it fit the world. Christianity has guiding principles that have some application. And sometimes, depending upon culture, it looks like you can do contradictory things and claim both of us are doing the right thing. And because of culture... In this culture, you do it this way, and in this culture, you do that same principle this other way, and they look contradictory. And honestly, if you use this culture's technique in this culture, you'd be wrong. If you use this culture's technique in this culture, you would be wrong. But you're both fulfilling the same principle. And Paul here is dealing with principles. You want to aim for these outcomes. And with these purposes, he's not giving a moral code. He's trying to give it in generalities. And because he's never been there, he's never talked to them directly. He's being the authority that sent the person that did talk to them. He's not giving it in great detail. He's not explaining it. He's giving it and assuming they can apply it. Because he's told them, Use the Holy Spirit to apply. And um, so here 
Other places he goes into more detail about these same topics, and we could deal, deal with that in a lot of ways. But uh, we could go back and compare with those things and say, here's what he meant when he, he expands. But you know, let's just deal with it and deal with it in 21st century United States, uh, or even North Texas United States. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to sit here and try to apply these to every culture in all time. Let's deal with our situation. Wives, submit to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. And that's all he says to wives. Elsewhere, he mentions that it's the natural attribute of women to love men. He, uh, you know, deals with But he's dealing with the character of their heart. Christian women should, as their response to God, submit to their husbands. Now, to let's look at what that word means, because the world twists that word in all kinds of inappropriate ways. And you will listen to, if you listen to the world's debate about uh, that you will hear people that ha are using it in a twisted way and saying, you know, women should not submit. Submission is not subjugation. Husband cannot submit his wife. If he's causing her to submit, he's subjugating her. Submission is the woman willingly choosing to serve the man the way he needs done. Choosing to do what elsewhere Paul says we should mutually submit to each other. It's the same concept. We're choosing to do what's best for another because they need it. It's not about who's in charge, who gets to set the agenda. It's not about um, who can order the other around. There is nothing uh, opposed to a woman who is a natural leader leading in some sense in the family. There, in this state, and honestly, a leader is a servant to those who follow them because they're setting up the conditions for their success. At my work, they make that explicit, that supervisors, your job is to make sure that your workers have the tools and the supplies it takes for them to do their job. The next level up, your job is to make sure that there's a long-term budget process that supplies those supplies and those uh, that those tools and that the work rules encourage the workers to do it right and that the easy way to do it is to do it honestly and ethically and correctly and the next level up does long-term planning and interfaces with other parts of the, uh, of the city so that we get the long-term need uh, there's somebody in the city that looks uh, five years out, 10 years out, 25 years out, 50 years out, 100 years out, and says, Where does the city, what's the city going to look like in that length of time? And what do we need to meet that need that's going to be there then? And then we have to come back and say, Okay, if that's going to be the need, then we're going to need these things, and this is what it's going to take to get there. And so there's people looking long term. And how are we going to meet that? And there's all kinds of things that come in there. And, you know, since it's the water department, some people look at where are we going to get the water? Some people are going to be, how are we going to be able to treat that water uh, and supply it to the people and then treat the waste? And what kind of changes are there going to be in regulation to both treated water and waste, treated wastewater? And how do we meet those? And, you know, uh, it's a very complex set of tasks. 
And there's people in there that also go, well, we're going to make sure that we're actually meeting all these regulations today so we don't set up a condition where we can't do it tomorrow because we're under so much uh, guidance from uh, the federal government or whoever or paying so many fines we can't afford to do what we need to do for the future. And um, trying to look at the overall cost and minimize the overall cost. Even if that means we've got to spend more today so we can save some tomorrow. And so it gets very complicated, but those higher levels are very explicitly not forcing people down below to do the job right. They assume the bottom rung people are doing the job the city needs done. And they are going to encourage it, sure, my direct supervisor will make sure that I do that job right, and my peers do that job right, and will, you know, uh, supervise us, make sure we're doing it, uh, validate that we're doing it. And they have a peer review system where we look at each other and help each other out, and it's a group thing. And quite honestly, we know that nobody cares who did the thing wrong. Everybody's going to be blamed. You know, the, you know, if it gets out the lab, analyze things wrong, nobody's going to say Frank did it wrong. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to say, you know, some other person that, that works with me did it wrong. The lab did it wrong. I'm just as guilty as they did if they did it. They're just as guilty as I am if I did it wrong. Um, honestly, if it's a different section of the lab that did it, uh, say the micro section, which I don't do with it, their work, if they did it wrong, I'm still guilty because they did it wrong. We're in this as a team. And as such, we have to support each other and encourage each other and validate each other, but also check to make sure we're doing it right. That we're honest people and we're applying ourselves correctly. And a lot of the friction we get at work is because somebody thinks somebody else is being lazy. Um, that's actually socially uh, one of our biggest complaints is somebody else is being lazy. I'm working too hard and they're just sitting there. Well, very often when we get into it, that other person is doing something that's important. And the last time somebody complained about me being lazy, I was doing paperwork that needed to be done uh, for the long term. Uh, the piece of paperwork I was working on uh, had a two-year uh, outlook. <laughs> it had to be done sometime in the next two years kind of thing. And it had to be validated and all that. And yeah, I was sitting there at my desk looking, doing paperwork, I looked lazy. I would much rather been doing what that other person was doing and let them do that. But my boss assigned me to do it and them to do what they did. And once they found the boss found out that that's what they were complaining about is I was doing the job that I was assigned to do and that it looked lazy, you know, they straightened it out pretty quick. Yeah, no, Frank's doing what I assigned him to do. He's working on this. Uh, and we do occasionally call each other out because somebody pulls their cell phone out and's playing a game instead of actually contributing work. Now, if everybody's going to have, uh, you know, there's some weeks where we, we have six hours of work each, and we just kind of spread it out. And if somebody plays for two hours, we generally encourage people to play the last two hours of the shift. That way, you know, if something comes up, we can get done. If you've done your work, then there's nothing to do. Just, okay, play around. Play. That's fine. Don't play for two hours and then try to get six hours worth of work done. Because occasionally, you get an hour's worth of work come in. And if you've done your six hours of work and then the work hour's worth of work, you do seven hours, and then you get to play for an hour. If you've goofed off for two hours, then you've got seven hours worth of work. Uh, now, 
everybody's okay with you <laughs> really but what's going to go on because somebody else is going to pick up the work and they get to work seven hours when you should have done it and yeah but that all sorts itself out we're all serving each other and leadership is not out of serving uh, in Christianity, we talk explicitly talk about servant leadership. As a Bible teacher, my job is to have you understand Scripture and what you should be doing better so that you can do the work of the church. Frank and Oscar and Bill and Dale should not do the work of the church. Becky does not do VBS by herself. She's the leader of VBS. She may do a lot of planning and a lot of organizing, but when she recruits, say, Cora to head up the food, Cora may consult with her about, do we, they got a choice for Tuesday of this or this. They both look good. Um, as far as I can tell, they're about the same cost. Which one should we do? Which one do you think will go over better? And they may talk about that. But when they make a decision, Becky doesn't go back and micromanage Cora. Did you get the right supplies? Did you organize it right? Did you keep things sanitary? Is everybody wearing their gloves? Is everybody washing their hands? Etc. Etc. She lets Cora do that job. Cora does that job. And Cora has some good assistants, and they work together well, and they've learned what to do, and they follow Cora because they know Cora knows food service well. And they get in there and do it right. And really, the rest of us don't have to worry about what the snacks are. Are they handled correctly? You know, my job, partly is to get the kids from point A to point B, and it's now time to go to snacks. And now motivating to go to snacks is not tough. But, you know, part of my job is to get them by the restroom and have them wash their hands after they use the restroom before they go to snacks. Uh, that's a little bit of a harder motivation. But, you know, get them snacks. I don't have to worry. Did Cora and her team fix good food that the kids would like? Is it going to be sanitary food. I don't have to worry about does Johnny have a food allergy to whatever and are they going to serve him because Cora and her team knows the food allergies and has learned the kids and there's Johnny. He's the one that can't have. And so they have a special plate for Johnny that doesn't have that and that they've handled specially so they didn't cross-contaminate. And that kind of thing goes on. That is servant leadership. That is submission. That's what Paul is talking about here. It has nothing to do with who leads. It has nothing to do with somebody being able to order somebody else around. It is all about meeting the needs and serving the role you're supposed to serve. In 21st century North America, that may mean, as a wife, you go out and earn half the money in there. And drop by, you know, Boston Chicken on the way home and come home with supper. It doesn't mean you have to slave away in the kitchen, work uh, a full-time job, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, our economy is set up differently. In a rural agrarian society, um, the woman's role may be take the raw food stuff dead, grew, prepare them into food, cook it, serve it, clean the dishes, uh, Take the raw agricultural materials and turn it into clothing. Make sure it fits people. Clean it when it needs to be cleaned. And keep the domicile running. 
in 21st century America, uh, urban society, let's face it, washing clothes, washing dishes, um, getting food on the table, um, those are tasks almost anybody can do. Some people have more cooking skills than others, and they may enjoy it more, or they may not. Uh, some couples, I've seen couples that neither one of them cooked. Um, they would joke he could cook better because um, he could pour milk in the cereal bowl without spilling it as easy. Uh, they basically ate out or bought and brought in. Uh, one of them had problems taking a frozen pizza out and cooking it in the oven and getting it out in an edible condition. The other one could do that fairly well. Um, having been raised by my parents with both of them cooking and different cooking styles and different cooking techniques and learning both their techniques, um, frozen pizza, who wants that? That's, uh, that's nasty. Um, it's barely food. But, you know, I can also start with flour, water, yeast, and make bread dough and make a pizza dough and a block of cheese and a roll of sausage and end up with a pizza and individual spices. And this particular couple, if you handed them four bottles of spices and a jar of tomato sauce, they wouldn't have known how to make pizza sauce. Um, You know, people have different skill sets. And you're going to have to look at your own family and who has what skills and who's willing to learn what skills and do it. And if y'all decide together that, you know, Whataburger needs to prepare your meals, enjoy Whataburger. You're going to spend more than if you bought the ingredients and cooked it yourself, but you'll also spend more time. And your time and your your earning power may say, we appreciate the restaurant. And if that's so, go enjoy the restaurant. So, yeah, food's got to be prepared. Um, with washing machines and dishwashers and, you know, all the tools that we have to make housework easier, there's nothing wrong with dividing labor up differently. Wives submit to your husband means figure out what his need is and make sure it's met. And that is going to mean the two of you have to talk and they have to discuss it explicitly and decide what needs to be done. And uh, I like the concept that my children came home from college with the roommate agreement idea is uh, they had an explicit, one of them had an explicit, their college, when you went into the dorm, they said, here's the tasks that need to be done between the two of you. Y'all talk about it, split them up, decide who's going to do what for who, whether y'all going to each do your own task completely separately, or y'all going to combine or what, and work it out so it works. And I like that concept. Now, for a college dorm situation, it's fairly simple, and they had some things the university wanted and some things they knew that college students would need and want, and they were making explicit, here's the things you got to have. Now, the way I taught my children, the way Frank and I taught our children, they understood the concept in a bigger sense than just a roommate agreement between two individuals in a dorm room. And, uh, you know, they've applied it several different places, 
And um, when Nathan and Blaze got married, I heard them discuss it, you know, using the term uh, roommate agreements. Uh, you know, who's going to do what? They were explicitly dividing up the task. Here's the things we need to do to be responsible adults and live adult lives. And it's all got to be covered. And so who's going to do what? That is submission. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Love is bigger than submission. Yeah, it's meeting the other's needs, but it is also being uh, talking about not just doing for them, but a bigger purpose of having the right attitude toward them, having uh, a planning for activity, and that uh, looking out for their interest and their need. Mutual submission, Paul talks about elsewhere, and talks about it in marriage. But here he's talking about a bigger concept than just mutual submission. Yes, two people that mutually submit together, that love each other, can work it out and make it work. But somebody has to look for the big term, big uh, picture, plan for the future, organize uh, things. And that has to be done in love with the right attitude and not being harsh sure uh, part of that is, is somewhat of a leadership role yes but uh, men can very easily get into being very harsh when they're leading I, I know that learning to be a leader in Boy Scouts there were some times that I was in charge of some little thing and had people under me and they failed to do, and I could get very harsh. And sometimes turned them off, sometimes it did motivate them, but I learned eventually that being less harsh while still holding them to the standard was much more effective. That if they knew they were hurting themselves and the team, and that they were disappointing the rest of us, they were being they were much more likely to want to do it the next time and do it correctly. Or if they just really couldn't do it, to speak up and say, I don't want to build fire. I'm not good at building fire. Johnny's better at building fire. Johnny's is assigned to do X. Let's let Johnny build the fire because he's good at it. And I want to do X instead. Instead of being harsh with them because I didn't do the job. Men, you have to be loving as you discipline. And that gets into the next. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. The very nature of being born, you know nothing. Your parents raise you, they teach you about the world, they teach you things like language and how to clothe yourself and how to wash your hands and brush your teeth and hopefully teach you things like how to run a household, how to do household chores, how to wash clothes, how to wash dishes, how to cook, um, how to drive, how to do work and engage in profitable, meaningful work outside the home to bring in the money it takes to support the household. And all those things it takes to go from being an immature human being that can't even, um, you know, roll over by themselves to being a fully functioning adult. And there's, I don't know, tens of thousands of different tasks and things you have to do along the way and human beings are not necessarily great learners, and it takes a lot of talent and skill and uh, 
application to get there. I know it felt like I never matured really fast growing up. Always trying to grow up in a hurry. And as such, children need to respect their parents and all the trials it takes to teach them what it takes. The children don't know. They don't have the wisdom. They don't have the long-term view. They don't have the experience to know what they need. Parents know it better because they've experienced it. They have, you know, by the time they become parents, hopefully they've become employed. They have uh, provided for their own home, their own uh, food, their own clothing, etc., their own transportation, etc. And there's things we learned as parents. Likewise, when you're a parent, very often you turn to your own parents and go, oh, help, you've done this task of raising children. What do I do now? I'm lost. I'm, I'm struggling. And you get advice. And parents, I mean, grandparents, and your part of your role is to be the advisor and help them. And, you know, occasionally just take the load off for a little while so they can rest up and get moving again uh, and get to enjoy being grandparents. And that works in many different ways. But the parents, being older, having more experience, seeing more life, they have more wisdom than the child does. And so the child should respect that wisdom. And I appreciate my mother in that at a very, very young age, she explicitly pointed out that my father was wise, and he was very wise. He knew a lot of things about a lot of things, and he made a lot of really sound decisions, and a lot of people respected his wisdom because he'd sought the Lord out and sought wisdom out. And as he got into teaching about wisdom as I was a little older, he explicitly told how he got wisdom. And um, I'm going to sit here and say, because mother pointed out he was wise and that she was dispensing his wisdom for me and sometimes it didn't feel real wise at the time but I learned to appreciate my parents wisdom and then as dad taught me how he got wisdom and where its source was and he used scripture it became obvious to me how wise both of my parents were and how much they were dependent on God. And that, in turn, taught me wisdom. And that pleases the Lord. You need to teach your children and teach them it's not just because I'm an adult and I'm telling you. You know, at a certain age, and that age in somewhere in the second year of life, yeah, you just have them do it because you're the parent and you're the authority. Because they really need to know you are the authority. But after that, it gets to be, I'm doing this because I love you, and I have the experience, and I have the wisdom, and God's given me this role, and you need to learn it, because it's good for you to know this. And sometime in the busy and hurry of life, it's hard to get that across, and particularly in the moment when somebody's been irresponsible and there's a big mess and you've got to have them clean it up safely. But you also need to teach that you're teaching them because God has given you the task of teaching them about life. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Uh, again, this is dealing with the same thing we dealt with with husbands, with their wives, to, uh, you know, not be harsh. It's basically saying don't be harsh with your children either. Sure, discipline sometimes is harsh. Um, 
you know, that's just the nature of it. To discourage wrong behavior and encourage right behavior, you can't just do one approach or the other. You have to do both. But you have to do them both in a state of love. And to do it in such a way as to build them up into good behavior. Because if you don't build them up into good behavior, just try to trim out the bad behavior, they eventually get the idea they can do nothing right, and they become discouraged, and they're no longer motivated, and they know they're just going to fail at everything they do until they quit trying. And when you quit trying, then you fail at everything you're doing. You have to be encouraging in what's good and encouraging in what they can do. And when they do something right, point it out. And even when you have to discipline and that is harsh, you have to do it in a loving manner so they know it's for their own good. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. He's again dealing with this, and the terms that were in the Greek aren't what we think of as slavery here in North America. Not everybody he's talking to here was a owned human being. Uh, we could almost translate the words as employees, bosses. Or, or employees obey your bosses in everything. Um, the economic system was so different that uh, our English words don't match up well. I'll just put it that way. If you are working for another, do what they need done. Understand the task and the reason you're doing it so you don't do it in such a way as to fail the purpose. And you not only do what's needed, but you do it to meet the purpose. And if you do that, you will fulfill what needs to be done. And if you're doing it like Jesus would want you to do it, then you're going to fulfill that. And that's part of what he says in there. You know, you know, don't do it just because your master is watching you. Don't do it just to avoid punishment. Do it as if Jesus was there and watching you. And are you doing it right? Are you doing it, you know, the way that Jesus would want you to do it? And you're for fulfilling that higher purpose of fulfilling what God would want you to do. Then you're going to fulfill the lower earthly purpose for it. And I can tell you from decades of experience at work, applying that at work, applying that uh, to my social life, uh, other things, serving others, uh, serving at work like I was doing it for Jesus, benefits you at work. Bosses notice you do it to a better level and that you achieve just slightly more. And then it just works slightly better when you, you do it. And that gets you recognition and gets you opportunities and gets you the chance to go up and do other things. If you're doing it in a grumbling manner, like you don't want to be there, like you don't want to do it, like it doesn't matter, they also notice that. If you do it just for show, they can tell that you only work when they're there, and if they're not there, you're slacking off. They know. And, uh, yeah, okay, occasionally you can fool some of the bosses some of the time, but you can't fool, and occasionally you can fool all the bosses, but you can't fool all the bosses all the time. You know, some of them know your job better than you do. They've done it, and... Then they got promoted. And they know that. And they learn that. And those who they see as being responsible, they will give 
the responsibility and the freedom to do it right and they turn you loose and they don't check your heart. Those who they find lazy and they have to check on all the time to keep them focused, keep them doing, they do that because they need it done. If you're doing it like Jesus was with you all the time, which, by the way, he is, just in case you need that pointed out to you. Um, if you act like Jesus was your boss, you're going to do it right all the time. And so, you know, do it uh, with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. I mean, uh, that fills it up. Now, Jesus is the one that's going to give you the ultimate reward. Sure, there's earthly rewards for doing your job well. And by doing it for Jesus, I've gotten those earthly rewards, that extra responsibility, and very often the paycheck that goes with it, etc., etc. And that's been very nice. It makes this life easier. But, I wasn't really looking for the earthly rewards. I was already making a living. I wasn't looking to get just wealthy or having lots of authority or lots of power or lots of, you know, uh, the things in this life that people chase. I was concerned about the eternal and what God thought of it and was looking for the eternal rewards. And so, you know, I'm not just working at the water department to please my boss, or their boss, or their boss's boss. Even though those things are important to me, I mean, I do like good relations with the people that make sure I have the tools it takes to do the job, that look out for the long term so that uh, five years from now, we're still doing the task that needs to be done five years from now, instead of continuing to do the same things, and now we're outdated and outmolded and we can't keep up. You know, I, that kind of thing needs to happen, and I appreciate those people for doing that. And if they hadn't been doing it five years ago, ten years ago, twelve years ago when I was hired, honestly, my job would be impossible today. It's changed enough that there's very little that I'm doing exactly the same way as I did it 12 years ago when I was hired. Uh, the few things that are, um, I'm expecting sometime soon will change. And one of the big problems this past week at work is we've had to make one of those changes that happens every once in a while. And uh, it made one task a whole lot more complicated. I'm sure as we work it out, it'll get easier for us or we'll get used to it or something. But, you know, that kind of thing, jobs change. The technology changes. The way we do things change. Uh, the standard we have to meet changes. And so we've got to improve. And there's people that are thinking about that and figuring it out. And preparing for it. If I'm doing it, though, for Jesus, when a change, like the one that came down the pike this week, comes, I can see the purpose for it, and yeah, I see the problems with it, and I, but I can communicate it to my bosses in such a way that they can try to help me solve the problems it causes, So, because they want it to run smoothly too. And sometimes that just means informing them, such as the new way takes twice as long as the old way. They need to know that because they need to plan it. If they just... And part of what made this past week so tough is the bosses were out of pocket for various reasons. We knew we needed to implement it. took twice as long. We happened to get twice as much work in that area, and we assigned people that we would normally assign for that much work, and, it, you know, they couldn't handle it. Twice as much work. It takes twice as long. It just didn't work it. And the bosses had warned us it's going to be a tough week and it's going to take you longer. We thought they meant it's a new way of doing it and the first time you do it, 
it just takes you long. And that may have been what they thought. They may have seen it's going to take some serious time longer without knowing exactly how much. Um, we now have some data on how long, much longer it is. And I'm sure Monday when the bosses get in there and look at it and just start discussing it, you know, they're going to realize, oh, <laughs> we got to change how we do this and organize it because the old way isn't going to work anymore. We can't just assign one person this time, this time, and this time, and it's going to work right. I don't know what that's going to look like. That's their job. I have some idea, because in a different organization, I was in that role, and I've seen this kind of thing come down the pipe before, and other kinds of things I had to do. I trust my bosses to organize it well, and um, they are creative people. They will come up with if not an optimal solution, a better solution than the one we used this week. Uh, we use the bullheaded approach of let's just plow into it and keep moving until we get finished. And we had been explicitly told we approve the overtime if it takes it. So we did the overtime and you know, we got it done. You know, but um, the boss uh, worker relationship he's talking about here, he's talking about it in this section from the employee standpoint. And then he turns to masters. Uh, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. Because you have a master in heaven. Uh, you know, at my work, they make that explicit. They flatly say, the supervisor, part of your job is to make sure the supplies and the tools are there so the people can do the work. I'm not to go out and get, say, burettes. My boss is to make sure I have enough burettes. My, I don't have to go out and get pipette tips. I do need to tell my boss we're getting low on pipette tips and, you know, they're supposed to order it. I'm supposed to tell them enough time, you know, they can get them in in time. But they're also supposed to order enough that we can get it done and can keep getting it done. And keep an eye on it. And when it gets at a certain level, order more. That is part of what the boss is to do. And each level up looks at it a little bigger and more expensive level. Uh, you know, the direct supervisor, it's the cheap stuff. Uh, the level up, uh, the more expensive stuff. And the top of the laboratory is literally right now looking at buy, buying or building and outfitting a new building because he's realizing that pretty soon we can't get the work done if it continues to grow like this in the building we have. We're already having certain areas that are awfully constrained on space and um, time constrained and be nice to put another person in, but where are we going to put the desk? Where are we going to put them in the laboratory to do the work? And that's getting to be a hassle. And so he's looking at what does it take to get a new lab, uh, a new building, add on to this one or something. And uh, a bunch of people are looking at that because let's face it, you don't buy or build a building you don't outfit it, you don't retrofit it, you don't um, quickly and easily and cheaply. And um, the city tries to be frugal, so they're going to try to go as cheap as possible to still get the job done, but they want it done well. Uh, so they're not going to just throw up a cheap building that in five years is falling apart. They're going to build a really good quality building and expect it to use it for 50, 100 years. And, um, you know, I appreciate that because the some of the oldest buildings in the city were built over 100 years ago and expected to be used, and they're still in use. And we, yeah, we have to do some maintenance to keep them functional, but they're still being used. And I like that long-term viewpoint. And, yeah, it costs a little more up front, but it costs a whole lot less than tearing a building down and rebuilding or having to make do with substandard building that, that, that 
doesn't do what it should be doing. And that's the kind of thing he's talking about here. Masters, you're serving your servants to make sure they can do the job they're supposed to do. And so this whole passage is about mutual submission, even though he doesn't say it in here. We've looked at it in a different book earlier, the mutual submission idea. But here he is again saying it again, and it's one of those principles of Christianity. It doesn't matter whether we're applying it in the family, husbands, wives, children, parents, employees, employer, pastor, congregation. It all applies the same way. Okay, different specific application. But we are to do it as if we were doing it unto God. Holy Father, help us to be submissive people that look for what needs to be done and do it, it does it. Even when we're in a leadership role, that we would lead with love, without harshness, without overbearing, that we would lead in a loving manner, that we would teach and correct, not harshly but with love, that we would do what the other needs from whatever role we have, and we would be looking for their long-term good and figuring out how to do it right, that we would be doing it as with an understanding we are in your presence at all times and doing it correctly as we do so. In your holy name. I am your host, Frank Wright, Associate Pastor of Family Ministry at Grace Fellowship Baptist Church, and this has been the Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. This was recorded on Sunday afternoon, uh, November 12th, 2023, and Oscar finished up his uh, sermon series on old hymns, and um, I like the one today, uh, we wore it till Jesus comes, it's uh, it's, it's a nice hymn. Um, I appreciate the concept the hymn writer came up with that we are to do the work of the kingdom. And uh, it's not original with uh, the uh, songwriter, but uh, did a very good job of poetically, uh, poetically saying it. And uh, Oscar did a good sermon on that. He will be out uh, Sunday, and I hope to see you there. Uh, I will be preaching, and it will be all over Psalm 37. And so, if you haven't read Psalm 37 recently, I ask you to go read it this week and be prepared for Sunday. Uh, I hope to see you there Wednesday night so we can uh, discuss uh, Colossians. And uh, if not, uh, we'll see you on YouTube. You have a blessed week.